From New York, this is Democracy Now! I'm here in Ethiopia, and, and then on to Niger, to reaffirm a pledge that President Biden made at the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit late last year. As he put it, the United States is all in on Africa and all in with Africa. Secretary of State Tony Blinken's in Africa this week as the United States openly competes with China and Russia for influence across the continent. We'll look at how Niger has become a critical military outpost for the United States and look at the situation in Ethiopia four months after a peace deal was signed to end two years of war in Tigray. Then we begin our coverage of the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. So I'm thinking about the invasion occupation 20 years later. I'm thinking about the incredible destruction and devastation that Iraq and Iraqi society have experienced. And I'm thinking about the huge gap between the rhetoric of liberation and what actually happened. And to my mind, particularly women have been the biggest victims of the invasion. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Pentagon's released video of what it says is a Russian fighter jet forcing down a U.S. surveillance drone over the Black Sea Tuesday. The 42-second video shows an Su-27 Russian fighter jet pouring fuel on an MQ-9 Reaper drone and making a pair of close passes. After the second flyby, the video glitches before revealing damage to the drone's propeller. The U.S. says a collision caused the drone to crash into international waters south of the Russian-annexed Ukrainian territory of Crimea. On Wednesday, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said he called his Russian counterpart part to discuss the incident. So make no mistake, the United States will continue to fly and to operate wherever international law allows. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shoigu reportedly told Austin U.S. drone flights near Crimea are provocative and could lead to an escalation between Russian and U.S. forces. In Moscow, the foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said Russia had designated parts of the Black Sea off limits to any aerial traffic during Russia's military operations in Ukraine. You have heard representatives of the Pentagon and the Joint Chiefs of Staff say that the United States will continue to fly wherever it pleases, in accordance with international law. But if you follow this logic, then the space around the United States has the same status as the space over the Black Sea. In Moscow, Russian President Vladimir Putin welcomed Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad to the Kremlin earlier today. Assad said he welcomed a Russian proposal to set up new military bases in Syria and said Damascus has agreed to recognize Russia's annexation claims over occupied parts of Ukraine. Stock markets in Asia have tumbled after Credit Suisse Bank signaled it'll borrow up to $54 billion from Switzerland's central bank. The bailout pushed European markets higher after investors fled Credit Suisse and other financial stocks a day earlier, amidst fears the sudden collapse of U.S. banks, SVB and Signature, might trigger a wider financial crisis. In another sign of turmoil in the banking sector, shares of San Francisco-based First Republic Bank have fallen by nearly three-quarters over the past week, after ratings firms downgraded the bank's credit rating to junk. Meanwhile, Democratic Senators Elizabeth Warren and Richard Blumenthal have asked the Biden administration to launch a criminal probe into whether SVB executives violated civil or criminal law ahead of the bank's collapse last week. In a letter to the Securities and Exchange Commission and Attorney General Merrick Garland, the senators write, quote, one of the enduring failures in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis was the inability or unwillingness of the Justice Department and bank regulators to hold bank executives accountable for behavior that destroyed millions of lives and cost trillions of dollars of wealth. The nation's bank regulators cannot make the same mistake twice, they wrote. In Texas, a federal judge heard arguments Wednesday in a case that could restrict medication abortions throughout the country, revoking the FDA's two-decade-old approval of mefepristone, which is the most common abortion method in the U.S. Demonstrators rallied outside the courthouse in Amarillo. This is activist Janda Raker. 
it feels very discouraging. It feels like we have gone back in history. Um, when I was a young mother in 1962, they were just starting to let women take the pill. And so now we've come to abortions have been legal since 73, and now they're not. In Israel, hundreds of thousands of people continue to protest in the streets after Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu forged ahead with plans to upend Israel's system of checks and balances by gutting the power of the judiciary. In Jerusalem, thousands block roads outside the country's Supreme Court. Elsewhere, protesters took over a Tel Aviv highway, among dozens of other disruptions in cities and towns nationwide. The renewed protests came after Netanyahu rejected a compromise proposal to defuse the crisis put forward by Israel. President Isaac Herzog, who warned in a televised address that Israel stands on the brink of civil war. Whoever thinks that a true civil war, where human life is at stake, is a border we won't reach, has no clue specifically now in the 75th year of the state of Israel. The abyss is at arm's reach. Meanwhile, tensions between Israel and Lebanon rose after Israel's army said it killed an armed man who entered northern Israel and set off a car bomb Monday, severely injuring an Israeli civilian. Israel's military says it was investigating whether Hezbollah fighters from Lebanon were behind the blast. In Indonesia, indigenous people say construction of the new national capital is pushing them off their land, making them fear for their homes and livelihoods, as the nation prepares to move its seat of government from Jakarta to the east coast of the island of Borneo. Nusantara is set to be inaugurated as Indonesia's new capital next summer. In 2019, President Joko Widodo announced the move away from Jakarta, which is rapidly sinking into the Java Sea. This is Balik tribal chief Sabodkin. There's a large forest area in the new capital's construction zone, which used to be an arable land and the livelihood of our people. We are not hoping that it will be given back to us, but please do not disturb what we are left with, where we have been living for years. We've had enough. We've had to give in, and we can't let this be taken, too. The Indonesian government has pledged to build a sustainable, carbon-neutral city, but environmentalists warn its construction will lead to massive deforestation threatening endangered species. The Biden administration's approved a $31 billion merger between Canadian Pacific Railway and Kansas City Southern, the first major rail merger approved by U.S. regulators in more than 20 years. The new company, named Canadian Pacific Kansas City, will operate freight rail traffic over more than 20,000 miles of track in the U.S., Mexico and Canada. The merger brings the number of major U.S. rail firms down to six. It follows February's derailment of a freight train in Ohio that spread toxic chemicals across the town of East Palestine. This week, the Interunion Coalition Railroad Workers United passed a resolution opposing the merger, noting that rail industry consolidation has resulted in less competition, fewer jobs, severe traffic congestion, dissatisfied shippers, delayed passenger trains and serious safety concerns. Michigan lawmakers have voted to overturn an anti-union law approved by state Republicans in 2012. Democratic Governor Gretchen Whitmer has promised to sign the legislation, which will make Michigan the first state in nearly 60 years to roll back a so-called right-to-work law. Since the law took effect, Michigan unions have seen a decline of about 40,000 members. Twenty-six other U.S. states still have right-to-work policies in place. In Georgia, special grand jurors investigating interference in the 2020 election have heard audio of a phone call Trump placed to then-House Speaker David Ralston, in which the president asked the fellow Republican to convene a special session of the legislature to overturn Joe Biden's Electoral College victory in Georgia. That's according to new details of the grand jury's probe published in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which reports Speaker Ralston responded to Trump, I will do everything in my power that I think is appropriate. Ralston did not call a special session, and Biden's win in Georgia was ultimately certified, despite Trump's efforts. In January of 2021, Trump was recorded asking Georgia's Republican secretary of state to find 11,780 votes, enough to overtake Joe Biden. Fulton County District Attorney Fonnie Willis said in January a decision on whether to bring criminal charges against Trump is imminent.
The U.S. Senate narrowly confirmed former Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti as ambassador to India Wednesday, more than 600 days after his nomination. And despite reports Garcetti was aware his former deputy chief of staff, Rick Jacobs, was guilty of sexual harassment. A handful of Republicans joined the majority of Democrats to secure the confirmation after several Democratic senators came out against Garcetti. Earlier this week, Naomi Seligman, former communications director for then-Mayor Eric Garcetti, spoke out against her former boss on CNN. Predators can only continue to abuse when you have a powerful enabler. And Eric Garcetti is a very powerful enabler, and he is about to become more powerful. We have, um, we have a situation where he would oversee 2,000 or more employees, and he has not shown the judgment. He is unfit to become um, an ambassador or really to hold public office anywhere in this country or this world. Texas officials announced Wednesday they're taking over Houston's nearly 200,000 student public school district, citing poor academic performance and mismanagement is one of the largest school takeovers ever in the United States and comes as an affront to state Democrats and many families in Houston, where 90 percent of the student body is of color, primarily black and Latinx. It's the latest example of largely white and Republican state officials across the U.S. trying to take control over majority non-white cities. And in San Francisco, the city's Board of Supervisors accepted recommendations for a reparations plan that would offer $5 million to each eligible African-American resident, among other measures. It was just one of many steps on the way to making reparations a reality for black San Franciscans, but offered new hope for the movement, which regained traction following the 2020 uprising for racial justice. On Tuesday, backers of the reparations plan spoke at the board hearing, including black police officer Yolanda Williams. When my parents migrated here from Louisiana to San Francisco, it was for a hope and a dream that they would be treated fairly and equally. And for them to have had to witness the racial disparity that I received in this city as a peace officer was absolutely atrocious. It is time for you to do the right thing and provide us with the reparations. Make us whole. Make us important in your lives. Black lives matter. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Nermeen Sheikh. Hi, Nermeen. Hi, Amy, and welcome to our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Antony Blinken has arrived in Niger, becoming the first U.S. Secretary of State to ever visit the former French colony. Blinken's visit comes as the United States is openly vying with China and Russia for influence across Africa. Niger has become a critical U.S. ally in the Sahel region, which has seen recent military coups in Mali and Burkina Faso. In 2019, the U.S. opened a new drone base in uh, the capital of Agadez. The U.S. also has about 800 military personnel in Niger. The U.S. military presence in Niger made headlines in 2017, when four U.S. special forces and five soldiers from Niger were killed in an ambush. Niger also remains one of the poorest nations in the world. In the United Nations Development Program's most recent Human Development Index, Niger ranks 189th of 191 countries, with only neighboring Chad and nearby newly formed war-ravaged South Sudan below it. 80 percent of Niger lies within the Sahara Desert. Life expectancy is only 60 years old, and the mean education level for its 25 million citizens is only two years. Secretary of State Blinken arrived in Niger after a trip to Ethiopia, which we'll talk about later in the program. But we'll begin now with two guests. Here in New York, Stephanie Sable is with us, a co-director of Cost of War Project at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. She's an anthropologist who's researched U.S. militarism in West Africa and beyond. She just recently returned from Niger. We're also joined by Kumba Touré. 
She is chair of the board for Trust Africa and an ambassador for Africans Rising for Unity, Justice, Peace and Dignity, a writer and activist based in Senegal, but is joining us from Washington. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Um, <clears throat> let's begin with Stephanie Sable. Um, if you can start off by talking about Niger right now, why you believe Secretary of State, uh, in the first Secretary of State visit to uh, Niger, is there? What is the U.S. Interest in Niger. Yeah, this is a really significant visit. Um, it is a significant moment. France has just recently pulled out of neighboring Burkina Faso. Um, so it's a moment when uh, Western powers are kind of figuring out what the next steps are in the region. Niger is one of the last strongholds of U.S security partnerships in the region, um, which is increasingly spiraling into violence and chaos, um, led by some of militant groups affiliated with al-Qaeda and ISIS. And the U.S. sees Niger as one of its strongest allies in this region, which um, the U.S. positions as really one, uh, one of the latest fronts in the ongoing post-9-11 wars, what, what George W. Bush called the War on Terror. Uh, contrary to what many Americans think, this war is ongoing, and this is one of the latest fronts. And this visit to Niger is really a signal of, in, in part, how important strategically uh, Niger is for the United States. Stephanie, could you uh, explain uh, the context of this? Uh, how is it that not just Niger, but the broader Sahel region, uh, became such a focus for the U.S., and why the global war of, on terror now appears to be concentrated there, with a large number of uh, terrorist incidents. According to the Global Terrorism Index, almost 50 percent of all terrorist uh, terrorism-related deaths occurred in the Sahel region last year. That's right. Yeah, the region be began kind of spiraling into cycles of violence in 2012, uh, really in 2012, although a little bit before then, um, when Mali was politically destabilized in the north. Um, rebels that were formerly fighting for Gaddafi in Libya uh, looted his weapons stocks and came down into Mali, where there was a separatist movement. Um, and this, this uh, has led to kind of this spiraling cycle in which um, these militant groups have been gaining ground. Governments in the region, aided by uh, U.S. training, assistance, funding, equipment, have been really waging their own wars on terror. And this violence, the government-sponsored violence, has been one of the factors that's contributed to these intensifying uh, spirals of violence. So people, it's you know blowback, right? So a lot of a lot of recruitment to these militant groups uh, is coming in retaliation against uh, government forces that, in some cases, are indiscriminately um, targeting certain ethnic groups. Um, and uh, so it, it's it's really one of these situations where there's a lot of poverty, there's a lot of corruption. People feel abandoned by the central governments. Uh, the government is responding with force, um, and these situations are just getting worse and worse. Uh, Kumba Turi, if you could also uh, respond to uh, Secretary of State, State uh, Blinken's visit to Niger uh, and to the region, uh, the first of a Secretary of State, an American Secretary of State, to the region, the significance of the visit uh, and what you'd like to see come out of it. Thank you so much for, for having me here. Um, the first thing that I would say is that um, there is definitely a, a shift uh, that, is, that is needed in, in relationship between, you know, the U.S. <clears throat> and African, African countries. And I, and I see that, you know, with this visit and before the meeting where the different leaders of African country were invited here in the U.S., that is clearly uh, where, where we're, we're, we're going. But the truth is, in this region, um, everyone comes for their own interests, and the U.S. included. Uh, people are there for, um, you know, the natural resources. People are there for political influence. And um, different uh, nations elbowing each other for power uh, with total disregard uh, to the people who live on those, on, on those land. Uh, I, I believe for, for new relationship to really shape 
uh, Africa needs to be looked at as a continent where there are human beings, not just a place where, um, you know, uh, it's for, for power gain and, and, and for uh, exploitation. Uh, Kumbatori, if you can talk about the issues that are um, being faced by the continent, how you see the Rick Ukraine war affecting them, uh, issues from energy transition uh, to global health, um, and how this visit by the Secretary of State of the United States is viewed around Africa? Yeah, I would say that uh, most people on the continent are not directly connected to, to this visit. Um, you know, the U.S. Secretary of State is, is meeting with, with a certain level. It's high-level meetings, and it's meeting with, uh, most of the time, leadership that even people on the continent don't always uh, connect with or, or recognize as, as, as such. Most people uh, are, are abandoned by, by the, 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 their governments. Um, they, they, they figure out their lives for, for, for themselves. And we are yet to, to see a, a type of a cooperation or connection uh, with African people that, that really benefit African, that look at uh, um, people's health, that look at um, their education, that, that, that look at uh, what, what people need in terms of mobility. Uh, what is talked about is, is about war, about arms, about training military. And that's not the, the fundamental need of, of, of the people. Um, and yes, um, right now, with, with the war, um, you know, in, in, in Ukraine, um, that also is another power, uh, I would say, power game going on, because the truth is, right now, um, the U.S. and the EU are looking at African countries to align themselves to, you know, against, against Russia. Uh, which some of these countries are hesitant of doing, because, you know, for South Africa, for example, having received support, you know, the INC before, um, they, 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 for now, are, you know, really speaking in a neutral tone. And there are other countries also on the continent that are uh, not as quick as jumping just and saying yes to, you know, whatever the U.S. and um, the, the EU is saying. So right now, I think that um, this visit is, is more about really uh, uh, replacing um, you know, uh, the, the U.S. Uh, in, in front of uh, uh, other powers, whether it's China, Russia, Turkey, Japan, everyone has uh, now a, 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 a meeting or set up something to, to, to bring African leaders to, to, be, to be with them. Stephanie, if you could respond to what uh, Kumba said, in particular, talk about uh, the different countries that are uh, vying for influence in the Sahel region, and also the proliferation of small arms uh, across the region, uh, the increase in uh, smuggling, trafficking of small arms, and whose hands those arms are falling into, the various armed groups that are uh, fighting uh, in the region now. Now, and the role of the U.S. Right. So there are lots of countries in um, in the West African Sahel region who are involved in training Nigerian forces and providing uh, what they call security assistance. Um, the Germans and French and uh, <coughs> Italians. Um, there are also concerns about the, the Russian Wagner Group that is um, spreading in influence, particularly in Mali, and there are rumors that it might be gaining a little bit of influence in uh, Burkina Faso, and they've been accused of committing atrocities in the Malian War on Terror. Um, so it, it's really surprising. When I was in the airport in uh, in Niamey, which is the capital of Niger, um, and you know, and and Agadez, which is as you mentioned, where the U.S. Um, drone base is based. Uh, a couple 
some hundreds of miles into the desert to the north, um, you you see you know you see foreigners around. There's just a very I've I've been working in West Africa for um, 20 years and and I've never seen so many kind of um, Western military types contractors and things. The U.S. says it has about 800 soldiers posted in Niger, but that's doesn't re convey at all the the kind of numbers of contractors who are coming in to do trainings and um, and the numbers of uh, of special forces operations like the people who are coming in and out um, so it's really a, a significant operation it's significant um, in, for for other countries as well um, Germany included and uh, and others um, and this region, as you were as you were mentioning, has become a um, a hub for illicit trafficking, not just of small arms, but also drugs and and people. There's a big um, uh, migrants uh, smuggling route uh, in the desert of Niger. So it's it's a it's a central point in the desert. You can you can picture um, Agadez, where we were, was this for hundreds of years has been this trading post between coastal West Africa and the desert to the north. Um, and so it's it's been really important on trade routes for centuries. Um, and now a, a lot of what's going on is that these um, militant groups who are um, are saying that they're affiliated with uh, is the Islamic State and Al Qaeda. Um, are essentially a lot of people are saying you know these these guys are are, are bandits they're they're criminals who are um, kind of donning the mantle of the this you know so-called terrorism to uh, to smuggle these goods and and profit I wanted to ask you professor Savell in a moment we're going to be talking about this 20th anniversary of the US invasion of Iraq which really began uh, with um, the Bush administration uh, going after Niger, uh, or rather going after Saddam Hussein, saying he got uranium from Niger. That's how Niger oh. came into the consciousness of so many Americans. It was a false claim. The late Joe Wilson was sent there to investigate. He said it was false. But talk about how the U.S. has used Niger over the years and what effect that had, even 20 years later. Yeah, the U.S. began, you know, I think it's, it's important to situate U.S. actions in Niger, um, particularly in the wake of 9-11, the Sahel region became a kind of hidden um, and not, you know, major um, focus of U.S. counterterrorism activities. Um, so there, there was the Pan-Sahel Initiative that became the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership. And that, that started, you know, right after, um, in 2002, 2003, 2004. Um, and since all these, all these years, um, the U.S. has be, just been channeling a lot of uh, equipment and, and money for military operations. Um, even back before this region had much of a terrorist threat at all, this was um, what this cohort in that Bush administration, uh, they were acting according to the doctrine of preemptive war, wherein, you know, the, the slightest possibility of a terror attack warranted any kind of preventative action. We saw that happening uh, all over the world. So this is just one region. Uh, and and you can I, I have a map that I've put together of all the places. There's about 85 countries in the world where the U.S. is engaged in some sort of counterterrorism activity. And my research in, in the West African Sahel was really uh, kind of asking, well, wh what does it mean? How do we zoom in to this kind of data point on this map? And, and even though it's a kind of a drop in the bucket in terms of the mass massive Pentagon spending uh, on counterterrorism, uh, what does this mean for these countries? And so a country like Niger is getting millions of dollars of, a year in security assistance from the U.S., and that's really significant. And what that's done is it's created this framework that the appropriate way to fight the problem of terror attacks is with a war. 
Uh, historically, research shows that there's lots of other ways to address, for governments to address the problem of terror attacks. You can treat it as a policing problem. You can treat it as a matter of political negotiation, so incorporating militants into the legitimate political sphere, um, addressing the, the roots of people's grievances, primarily the fact that people are, are you know, needing jobs, they're needing to eat, they're just furious at corruption, they're furious at kind of being ignored by uh, government policy. Um, all of this stuff is driving the, the unrest. And if you treat that as a war problem and you send soldiers in and you start, you know, indiscriminately attacking certain groups of people, because, again, just like in other parts of the world, we're seeing certain groups of people um, who already bear the brunt of prejudice, um, so particularly like the Fulani ethnic group that are traditionally herders across West Africa and Muslim for centuries, um, they are bearing the brunt of a lot of government policies across the region. Um, so we're, we're seeing this war on terror, the, the consequences of this mentality that has been introduced and supported with all this money and weapons and political rhetoric over the years. We're, we're seeing the consequences of that play out. Kumba, you spoke earlier uh, about the different countries that are uh, in the region, in the Sahel region, uh, because of the resources in the region. So if you could explain what those resources are, uh, energy reserves, gold, uh, etc., and also the impact of the climate crisis in the Sahel region, which is reportedly heating at one and a half times the rate uh, of the global average. Yes. Um, you know, if we start with Niger, um, it is uranium. Uh, the issue is uranium. Why are, you know, why is everybody so interested in a small country that is, you know, desertic? Um, it's not because there is, you know, there is love there. Uh, the issue and, and is always about resources, and it always has been uh, for, for, for the, Af the whole African continent. And it's not something new. Uh, you take it back all the way, you know, from slavery to colonization to this day, um, uh, countries of the Western, you know, hemisphere, whether it's Europe, um, uh, U.S., Canada, people, um, these countries have come to Africa for the resources. And today, uh, the, the main resources that, that people are looking at are um, energetic resources, it's mineral resources, uh, of course, for arms, for technology, um, and, and, yeah, and for, for energy. Uh, but what, 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 what I really want to, sh to, 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 to convey is that it is about time that we, we, we look at the lives of people, that cooperation is about supporting you know, small farmers to produce, um, you know, um, uh, food that, 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 that helps people live healthy lives. It, it's about looking at health systems, uh, not, of course, supporting big pharmaceutical, but looking at health systems that actually touches people. Um, and uh, to, if we really want to build peace, it's not about um, arming and rearming uh, as much as possible people and, 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 and excluding uh, the majority of, of, of population. We need different relationships um, between our countries and, and the U.S., and it will be uh, part of it needs to come through people to people. I am here traveling in the U.S., just came from Selma. Alabama that, that has been tornado struck. But for 30 years, there's been connection between regular people in West Africa and uh, people in the U.S., uh, mainly from, from the, you know, African-American communities. We need to get at the bottom of, of, of this. Um, relationships start with respect. And, um, you know, the, the, the world has been functioning on, on white, white supremacy, uh, valuing white life, valuing people's life, and also valuing the fact that accumulation and profit is, uh, you know, the, the, the call of the day is what needs to be done. And we need to change that. 
Kumbatori, we want to thank you so much for being with us, chair of the board for Trust Africa, ambassador for Africans Rising, a writer and activist based in Senegal, here in the United States. Uh, Stephanie Savel, uh, Savelle is a co-director of the Cost of War Project at Brown University's Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. She's an anthropologist whose research U.S. militarism in West Africa and beyond, just back from Niger. Next up, we look at the situation in Ethiopia four months months after the peace deal was signed to end two years of war in Tigray, and just after Secretary of State Blinken has left there. Stay with us. Walk on, walk on straight through the roof, straight through the hole in the ceiling. Take your place in the sky. by Maclit Hedero. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. As we continue to look at U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken's trip to Africa, we turn to Ethiopia. On Wednesday, Blinken met with the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and other top officials, including leaders from the northern Tigray region. Blinken praised the four-month-old peace deal that ended two years of fighting between government troops and forces in Tigray. He called for accountability for war crimes committed without casting blame on either side. The conflict was absolutely devastating. Hundreds of thousands killed, widespread sexual violence against women, millions forced to flee their homes, many left in need of food, shelter, medicine, hospitals, schools, businesses, shelled, destroyed. The cessation of hostilities agreement is a major achievement and step forward, saving lives, changing lives. During his trip, Blinken announced $331 million in new U.S. humanitarian assistance for Ethiopia. To talk more about Blinken's trip there, we're joined by Tzedala Lema. She is a journalist and the founder of At a Standard, an English-language monthly news magazine based in Ethiopia. She's joining us, though, from Germany. Uh, welcome back to Democracy Now!, Tzedala. It's great to have you with us. Uh, talk about the significance of this trip and what's actually happening uh, in Ethiopia and in the Tigray region. How is this deal holding? Holding up. Thank you, Amy. Good morning, and thanks for having me again. Um, it's an important trip by the Secretary of State because the U.S. is one of the major brokers of the peace deal that was signed in November between the Tigrayan officials and the federal government. And the agreement, the peace agreement, is not really going according to what was stated in the documents that were signed in Pretoria and in Nairobi after that. So it's very important that the secretary made this trip to push uh, for the implementation, the full implementation of this agreement, uh, because the, the implementation is lacking behind. We're not seeing uh, so much, uh, so much has changed, but not enough uh, is, is, is on the ground. So it's important for him to make that visit. Dali, could you explain what were the terms of the agreement uh, that you say are not being met? The terms of the agreement, um, most importantly, are the 
establishment, the normalization of relations between the Tigray state and the federal government, and the establishment of an interim government in Tigray regional state, which is really lacking behind because the federal government, although it's not stated in the peace agreement, is holding the disbursement of the budget for the regional state until after Tigray formed its uh, interim government, uh, dismantled the previous government that was elected uh, shortly before the war erupted, and established an interim government. So the federal government is still holding the budget for the regional state. Civil servants are not being paid as we speak. It's been more than two years. So this is lacking behind, and they need to put a lot of pressure on this to put it on fast track. Other uh, implementation of the, the peace agreement, the full restoration of services uh, in the region, telecommunication and banking, although it has been restored, the level is not by uh, any, any chance close to what is needed on the ground. Humanitarian access is also uh, not that fully being implemented currently. So it's very important that the peace agreement is uh, fully complied by both parties. Dali, you mentioned that the U.S. was one of the main brokers of this agreement. Who were the other parties involved, and how can uh, the agreement be implemented? The other parties involved are the African Union itself. And the African <coughs> Union has, uh, through the support of the U.S. government, established a monitoring and mechanism, um, verification mechanism. But we have not had any report from this office so far about the implementation of the peace agreement. We have seen initially the disarmament of heavy weaponry by the Tigran forces, and they have handed that over to the federal government. But foreign forces still remain on the soil of Tigray. In fact, Eritrean forces continued to be impl implicated in uh, atrocities and rape against Tigran civilians. Amhara forces still continue occupying western Tigray and southern part of Tigray. So this uh, report that from the verification and me uh, mechanism has not has not surfaced so far yet. So it's being uh, the other parties are the African Union itself. Um, so there is a there is a need for this verification and mechanism office to follow through what is being implement, implemented and what has not been followed through by, by the parties, particularly the federal government, which has the responsibility of evacuating foreign forces from the sovereign land of Tigray. I wanted to talk about the issue of genocide, Sadala Lema. Um, in late 2021, Blinken said the U.S. would decide whether the crimes committed in northern Ethiopia constitute genocide. The um, State Department, according to a recent piece in Foreign Policy, the State Department drafted a declaration in 2021 that the Ethiopian government's atrocities in Tigray constituted genocide, according to three. U.S. officials familiar with the matter, but it never released that declaration. Your response? Yes. Uh, I think uh, some of my colleagues on the ground yesterday tried to ask this question to the Secretary uh, of State. Um, and he, I think his response was very vague in that regard. Yes, this report, you know, Secretary Blinken, let's, let's first uh, g get back to it. He was the first highest level U.S. official to admit that an ethnic cleansing um, take place, did take place in the early days of the war in Western Tigray. And this report now that we are learning uh, the designation as a genocide is shelved. Uh, I think, you know, the U.S. is trying to leverage diplomacy over uh, the issue of human rights. Uh, I don't think the U.S. will come forth to publish this report, because designating what happened in Tigray as genocide requires you to follow through. And the U.S. currently is more focused in securing the, you know, the, the Ethiopian government side, or Ethiopia as a partner, as opposed to, you know, competing powers from the Middle East and, you know, Russia and China. So the U.S. is in that competition of winning Ethiopia as it is, you know, traditional ally and a bulwark of uh, stability previously in the Horn of Africa. The region is experiencing quite a lot of competition from these competing powers. And the U.S. Uh, wanted really to have the prime minister on its side. So I don't think they will be releasing this report, although it's somewhere in the shelf sitting there. 
Yali, before we conclude, if you could just give us a quick background on the war, what led to this situation and this, uh, the commission of this, uh, uh, effectively, uh, what has been called a, a genocide? The war uh, started in uh, November 2020. Uh, previously, in, in September 2020, Tigray, uh, as a federated member of the Ethiopian federal uh, government, uh, went ahead in holding a unilateral election for regional council members. And after that, the relationship between Tigrayan officials, led by the TPLF, the party that's governing Tigray today, and the federal government was going down the hill. You know, they were having their sole relations previously already after the coming of the prime minister. But that election was a watershed moment that really put the final nail uh, on the coffin for the outbreak of this war in November, uh, shortly, two months after Tigray held this election. So that is really at the heart of the contest between the two. And the, the war, uh, the outbreak of the war was also aided and abetted by Eritrea next uh, door, because Eritrea has historically been against, you know, the Tigran, uh, the TPLF, which was a, a dominating uh, political figure in the past, previously, before the prime minister came to power. So Eritrea had a score to settle with Tigray. Uh, Abiy Ahmed, as a prime minister, was unhappy that Tigrayans went ahead and held their election for local council. This was not flying well in his uh, an, you know, anticipation of uh, uh, centralizing power. So the two came together and the war broke out in November. After that, what took place uh, is for the history books, very tragic unfolding to the point that now we have a report uh, that designated what took place in Tigray as genocide, but we may not be able to see it officially soon. Sadala Lema, we want to thank you so much for being with us, a journalist, founder of the Ada Standard, an English-language monthly news magazine based in Ethiopia. Next up, we begin our coverage of the 20th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Iraq. Stay with us. Sleep My Little One by the Iraqi musician Seta Hagopian. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Twenty years ago today, peace protests rock the globe, held across the world, urging the United States to halt its imminent plans to invade Iraq. There were over 6,000 candlelight vigils held March 16th. 2003, as part of a day of action called by the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa and others. Three days later, U.S. President George W. Bush announced the invasion of Iraq had begun. He spoke on the night of March 19, 2003, in Washington, D.C. It was already March 20th in Iraq. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. On my orders, coalition forces have begun striking selected targets of military importance to undermine Saddam Hussein's ability to wage war. These are opening stages of what will be a broad and concerted campaign. President Bush justified the invasion on the false claim that Iraq's formerly U.S.-backed dictator, Saddam Hussein, was secretly amassing WMDs, weapons of mass destruction. 
Over the coming days on Democracy Now!, we'll look back at how the U.S. invasion devastated Iraq, caused upheaval around the globe. Today, we're joined by Naja Alali. She's the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University, where she's a professor of anthropology and Middle East studies. She's also the author of several award-winning books on the U.S. invasion and occupation of Iraq, including What Kind of Liberation? Women and the Occupation of Iraq. Uh, Professor Aladia, welcome to Democracy Now!, Professor Alali. Um, yeah, you're joining you. us from thanks. Providence, where you're a professor at Brown. You've been looking at right. this and your own history for years. Talk about what we should understand 20 years after the U.S. invaded Iraq. Well, the invasion had a devastating impact on Iraqi society. I mean, myself have been trying to document the uh, gap between the rhetoric of liberation and bringing human rights, democracy, and particularly in relation to women's rights to Iraq, and the reality of what happened in the aftermath, with putting it against the historical background of 13 years of the most comprehensive sanctions that a country ever experienced. I think that's really important, that when we think about the devastation and destruction of Iraqi society, it actually doesn't start in 2003. It started with the sanctions regime on the 2nd of August, 1990. Um, but, yeah, to my mind, really, the biggest losers in the post-invasion scenario have been women. I mean, the very same people that actually President Bush used them as a symbol of the, the midwives of the new Iraq, as he used to say. Um, and while it is true that, you know, women have Initially, in the aftermath, there was some hope. Uh, there was quite a bit of mobilization, a mushrooming of women's rights organizations. What we have seen systematically since 2003 is an erosion of the kinds of rights and the access to resources, to health care, to education, to labor force that women actually had during the Ba'ath regime. And I'm in no business of uh, justifying the atrocities that Saddam Hussein committed during the 35 years of Ba'ath. But the fact is that to the 2003 invasion led to greater gender-based inequality, uh, towards a shift towards greater social conservatism. It um, led to lawlessness, chaos, a destroyed infrastructure, health care is in shambles, education is struggling. And so everyday life has become really, really hard, not only for the thousands and thousands of Iraqis who have been displaced internally or have become refugees in neighboring countries or come to Europe or to the U.S., but, you know, people who stayed behind. And so um, for me, you know, the story of the past 20 years is a story of um, destruction, devastation, corruption, uh, incompetence, but also a story of resilience. I mean, you know, Iraqis are not just passive victims. And when I think about the 20 years, I'm not just thinking about the U.S. and the U.K. and their responsibility. I'm also thinking about corrupt Iraqi politicians, sectarian militia leaders and um, criminal gangs who have been terrorizing the country. And while they have been facilitated by the invasion, they also have to take responsibility. So it's a very complex picture. But um, I think, you know, one of the things that we've seen is that there's a new generation of Iraqis who's really trying to turn things around. We have seen large-scale protest movements over the past few years. Um, so there is some hope, but it's what we've seen really is a tragedy that has been unfolding, and that was definitely not necessary. And although I don't think that there is a good invasion, I think that in addition to the invasion, the U.S. did everything wrong that it could have done in the aftermath of the invasion. So, Professor Ali, could you elaborate on that? What did the U.S. do uh, after the invasion that was wrong? Well, uh, I mean, most notably the disbanding of the military, <clears throat> and all of a sudden we have, uh, you know, million-plus young men on the street without jobs, with arms, that contributed to the uh, creation of militia and, you know, lots of uh, grievances uh, within this uh, element of population. 
Uh, the other thing is to go into Iraq and think of it in sectarian terms. So the coalitional provisional authority that was established um, by the U.S. was all based on so many Sunnis, so many Shias, so many Christians, so many Kurds, instead of thinking about the country in terms of political terms. So that actually reified um, and contributed to the sectarian divisions in Iraq. Aside from um, the fact that uh, women's rights were the first, the first things that dropped off the agenda. I mean, you have uh, in the aftermath of the, of the invasion when there was an explosion of lawlessness and chaos and gender-based violence, you have had uh, US um, military personnel who were approached by Iraqi women's rights activists and who were told, well, we don't do women. So, you know, despite all this rhetoric of, yes, we are, we are contributing to the liberation of women, the opposite took place. Um, the U.S. administration, um, the military, and also the coalitional provisional authorities turned a blind eye when, we've, when we saw the mushrooming of uh, gender-based violence. And then also uh, debathification, although, of course, uh, it was very important, the process of coming to term with the past 35 years of a brutal dictatorship. But the way that debathification actually ended up working um, was that it really alienated a large percentage of the population and it contributed again to the sectarian divisions. And we know, of course, that ISIS is one side effect of the uh, invasion and the occupation. Professor Ali, you mentioned, um, I mean, to look at the context in which this invasion took place, uh, it was it came after 11 years of these brutal sanctions uh, uh, against Iraq, more than 11 years, I think it was 13 years. 13. 13, 13 years, years, yes, yeah. sorry. 13 mm. years of sanctions, and just prior to that, uh, Iraq having emerged from an eight-year war with Iran. Correct. So if you could uh, yes. talk about both those yes. things. Yes. Yeah, no, I think, you know, we, we really need to think uh, more carefully about the 35 years, because in the 70s, actually, Iraq was, despite being a dictatorship, it was flourishing economically. Um, you know, there was the push for women to enter the labor force, education. Um, there was a welfare state. Things started to get um, worse during the 80s, as you mentioned, from 1980 to 88 the war with Iran. Uh, during this period, um, everyone between, every man between the ages of 15 and 65 had to go to the front. Women during this period became super women because uh, Saddam Hussein at some point came out in 85 or 85 and said every good Iraqi woman should have five children. At the same time, well, women were under pressure to produce the future soldiers of Iraq. They were, you would find them in all kinds of jobs. So when I was visiting Iraq during that time, I saw women at, working at petrol stations, uh, driving trucks. And so, you know, women filled up many of the jobs that were previously held by men. So not a good situation, but a situation where women did play an active role. And then from, after following the invasion of Kuwait in, um, in uh, August 1990, we had the onset of sanctions. And although the idea was, the justification was to contain Saddam, it actually had the opposite effect. Um, Saddam controlled the limited resources. It's during this time that we saw this incredible uh, shift in terms of uh, increased poverty. We saw the feminization of poverty. We saw that um, all the welfare services that the state provided, like free childcare, uh, free transportation to work, a robust healthcare system, a robust education system, all this eroded during this period. And um, I remember my aunt telling me during this uh, time, she said, you know, the first Gulf War um, 1991, following the invasion of Kuwait, bridges were destroyed, but sanctions destroyed our society and, you know, you cannot recover from that. Professor Alali, oh, if you could end, we just have a minute with your what you want yes. to leave people with on this 20th anniversary of the war. 
Um, well, I think that uh, for people in the U.S., uh, this is high time to, you know, rethink U.S. military interventions in the world. But it's also time to think about um, responsibility, accountability, and possible reparations. But I also want to end on the note that, as I said, the young generation of Iraqis are trying to uh, go beyond, live beyond the impact of the invasion occupation. There's lots of creativity, resourcefulness, and positive energy. So I have some hope, but I think for people, especially in this country, you know, it's high time to um, really rethink U.S. military involvement and also policy more broadly, not just in Iraq, but in the Middle East and the world generally. Nadja Alali is director of the Center for Middle East Studies at Brown University, where she's a professor of anthropology and Middle East studies. Her books include What Kind of Liberation? Women and the Occupation of Iraq. In fact, there are still 2,500 U.S. troops in Iraq. Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for a digital fellow. Learn more and apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! produced with Mike Burke, Renee Feldstein, Augusta, Messiah Rhodes, Maria Tarasena, Tammy Warren, Afterina Nadura, Sam Malkoff, Tay Maria Astridu, John Hamilton, Robbie Karen, Honey Masood. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. <laughs>